Um, it's Michaeline O'Neill McCann, M I C H A E L E N E, O apostrophe N E I double L. McCann is M C, capital C A N N. Okay. And can you state your position and agency? I'm an assistant district attorney and chief of the Victim Witness Services Program in the Essex District Attorney's Office in Salem, Massachusetts. <clears throat> okay, well, let me start by asking you, how did you get into the victim school? What brought you to this field and got you personally interested in it? Well, I, I guess it took me a while from the time that I can trace back um, to my interest. I was a very naive 19-year-old student nurse in an emergency room, and a um, police officer came in with a 12-year-old girl and her mother, and the mother had pulled her, f the, her husband, the father of this child, off of um, the daughter. He had um, been raping her. And uh, so I can remember being very horrified. And um, uh, really, I just I can still see the looks on both the mother's face and the, um, the young girl's face. Mm -hmm. And I think that stayed with me for many years until um, I was asked by a colleague in nursing if I was interested in getting involved in a community group that was looking at services for rape victims in our community. And I immediately s said yes. And she laughed and thought she would have to do a selling job. And I said, oh, no, I'm very interested. I really am. And um, I became interested um, even further. I got involved with that group and in fact um, was co-chair of that initial group and um, we tried to make contacts with the police departments um, with the hospitals in the area um, and um, I also discovered that I needed to learn a whole lot more and so I took my first course in sexual assault um, and through that I was connected with Dr. Ann Burgess, and um, a group, this was in 1975, and with a group of nurses and social workers that had um, evolved out of the study that she and Ann Wolbert did uh, at Boston City Hospital, started in 1972. Mm -hmm. So that group became volunteer rape crisis counselors in their home communities and educated ourselves, and it was really a support group as well in terms of peer supervision and counseling as well. Okay, great. Well, you are a victim of, uh, or excuse me, a veteran of the field, and obviously have been doing this work for, for quite a while. I was wondering if you could take a few minutes and sort of take us through the evolution of victim services and victims' rights in, in your experience over the last, how, how many years have you been doing this work? Since 1975. 1975. So could you, you kind of take us through just so we can get a sense of how things have, have evolved? Well, I, I, um, initially I think um, uh, that as a rape crisis counselor, the fact that I was a nurse helped enormously in gaining trust and credibility. Um, and I think that was a huge issue. Um, but it helped a lot with police officers um, that I was a nurse. Um, cops like nurses. Um, it also helped that for me personally that I had a retired father-in-law who was a, um, a police captain um, on the local police department, so he opened a few doors for me um, that I didn't know about until much later, actually, which was which was interesting. But um, I think that people were very threatened by the presence of counselors. Um, they thought they police particularly were going to be told how to do their jobs. Um, hospital people were more afraid of. Um, non-medical people being in the area. Again, being a nurse, an RN, helped me tremendously in that area. I was allowed to go into examining rooms with victims, um, and that didn't always happen. Um, prosecutors really welcomed, uh, for the most part, uh, at least in my experience, welcomed um, the assistance. And um, from being a volunteer rape crisis counselor, I then was employed um, in the late 70s, actually mid-70s, 
um, I'm sorry, under a um, what I believe was a human service grant from a, from um, the federal government, and um, it was required that rape prevention and treatment services be provided. And I was paid for 10 hours a week and worked about 60. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't have hotline um, numbers in those days, so police and hospitals had all of our home numbers. We did the first training course that I put together. Dr. Ann Burgess spoke, Dr. Nicholas Groth spoke, um, people who came and, and um, didn't charge a fee for training, and I had, um, I think, uh, 65 people signed up for that first course, and I was astounded. There was such a hunger for information and education, I think, um, both from professionals as well as, as um, people in the community. So I, I think there was just beginning to be a stir. And in the late 70s, I was hired to be a victim witness advocate um, in that same community in, um, which covered Middlesex, which was in Middlesex County in, in Massachusetts. And um, I covered all sexual assault uh, crimes for children and adults for two other jurisdictions as well. And when I look back now, the fact that I was young, I think, <laughs> allowed me to do that. Um, but, I, you know, I think we worked a lot of hours and, and we made sure that we responded promptly when asked and that um, I, I think we were trying to, um, to be accepted and to, um, we knew that victims were getting the assistance because they told us they were. They were telling us how much it helped. Mm -hmm. um, it was the providers, I think, that the police, the hospitals, um, the courts that I think we uh, were trying to to get to accept that process. Mm -hmm. And um, in in the seventies, um, I think prosecutors went for federal funds um, from. LEAA, which was Law Enforcement Assistance Administration funds, and they were required to have victim advocates um, at that time. And I don't know that many of them quite knew um, what to expect. Um, I know that I was hired in one for a district court, and I asked if, when I started, if they minded um, if I followed sexual assault cases through to the grand jury process and the superior court trial. Um, and they, I was told by the prosecutors, well, sure. And so it, that just evolved because I had cases that were already in that process and mm -hmm. did they mind if I followed through on those? Mm -hmm. And um, so it worked out well. And now that is so much of an institutionally accepted process. It's, it's, that's kind of, of great to see. Um, and that was happening in the late 70s, the early 80s. Um, we've definitely come a long way. Um, I think through the 80s, there was a lot of establishment um, of services, a lot of expansion. Um, I, um, I went from that program to law school um, in, in the early 80s. And, um, and what caused you to want to go to law school um, in the midst of all this? I was once asked that while I was in law school, and I, um, my immediate response was credibility, and my second response was power. That from my observations in the court system, that attorneys had a lot of credibility and power, and um, uh, social workers didn't necessarily uh, have that, or were not necessarily seen in that in that view. So, I had attempted to go to graduate school and spent a year at, as a part-time graduate student um, and really uh, felt that I could do all that I was doing with a lot more clout if I were an attorney. And, um, and that's proven to be very, very uh, truthful, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, it's, um, it has definitely helped tremendously to have a law degree and to be an assistant district attorney. It, it does give you additional credibility. Um, I think you have your feet in both fields, 
um, victim services as well as, as the law. So it does help tremendously. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, great. Well, um, I was curious to know, in, in your experience over those 20-some uh, years, what do you think has been the greatest challenge? Um, and how, is the, how have those kind of challenges uh, affected the way that uh, we attempt to provide rights and services to crime victims? I think the greatest challenge is is um, acceptance and the greatest um, and the acknowledgement that victims have rights. Um, that um, uh, that there's always the fear that victims are going to take over the system um, and that victims are going to call the shots. And in my experience, what they want is input. What they want is a say. Um, and we really. At, in most states cannot prosecute a crime without a victim's testimony and with with few exceptions um, and so I, I think that they are such an integral part of our system and yet um, it has been it has taken so long for us to acknowledge that um, and and I think the fears have not come true I think that um, that that a lot of, of victims don't want to make all of the decisions. They want input. Um, and I, I, I think that, um, that that's been a challenge um, for, um, for many to, to see that that happens. And I think the other challenge is, is, is seeing that victim rights are enforced across the board, that it's, it's not... Um, in many ways, um, the early days, you you were lucky if you um, if you were able to get a, um, a an educated nurse in an emergency room who was very familiar with um, a sexual assault exam and a police officer who had been to rape prevention training, and that I mean that was considered so wonderful if you could get that. And while you have many more, I, I mean I think police were really the first to embrace victim rights um, and the first to, um, you know, to really be victim advocates. And, and the hospitals, um, I think the courts, um, and, and I think in some um, areas of the court system, there's, there's still, um, uh, you know, some um, concern, particularly with the defense bar, that, that um, um, the victim rights might erode defendant rights. Um, so I, I think that that trying to keep that balance is important. Okay, great. Um, well, whether in the context of challenges or, or just sort of the general accomplishments um, of the field in your work, what strategies, tactics have you found have been most effective in sort of promulgating and, and moving uh, the prof profession forward and, and helping victims and in their interests? Wow, in the early days, um, it was as, as simple as, I'm going back to the mid-70s now, as wearing skirts to the police department when we responded instead of jeans. Um, I look back now on that and say, wow. Um, but we were very careful to, uh, you know, to create an image that, uh, that was accepted. Um, I think I've learned over the years not to battle every single issue. Um, I think, um, and I, I could tend to do that. So I've, I've learned I, the better you're educated um, about issues, the more intelligently you can discuss them. And, and also the strategies are I've, I've been very lucky to have worked for um, a district attorney who was the primary drafter of the Victim Bill of Rights in our state. And I, I worked for him, uh, or had worked for him for 18 years. So I and had that Kevin Burke, Kevin Burke, District Attorney yes. Kevin Burke, who has left office and retired. Mm -hmm. And I'm um, happy to say that his successor, District Attorney John Blodgett, uh, feels the same way about victim rights. And so it's, it's, um, it's very beneficial to be in my position and to have that that kind of support um, because it has to come from the top down. I think that's where you have to create the, um, the acceptance, the acknowledgement, um, because if, the, if it isn't there, then it's, it's a hit or miss 
uh, you know, in the ranks. It just, it has to be a policy. It has to be part and parcel of an approach in a prosecutor's office, um, particularly. And I, and I also think it has to be, um, the strategies also have to be that you have to work collaboratively with all of the other agencies that provide services. There's certainly enough to go around, um, uh, work to go around. There's, uh, there's so much to be done, and uh, we need to be cooperative. We need to be collaborative. Um, we need, uh, unfortunately, funds often put us in competitive positions, and I, I you know, I, th I, I think that people need to work really hard at and and do it on an ongoing basis. Um, at working together, at, at utilizing and, and, and pulling all their resources together so that the victim benefits, you know, that, that that's the ultimate goal, that we serve victims more appropriately and more effectively. So, so great. Um, what would you say is the greatest accomplishment of the field to date? Oh, the Victim Bill of Rights. And I, I truly, um, in my experience, it's been the, the most significant piece of legislation that's been passed in, 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 in states throughout the country, that, um, that we have something to fall back on. In some states, it's, um, they're better than others. Um, but I, um, I really like being able to say, Chapter 258B in uh, you know the Mass General Laws requires that you, or uh, that we provide such and such to victims. Um, it's a very effective tool, um, and um, prosecutors' offices have um, primarily two main tools. Well, I mean, uh, in in terms of legislation, I mean they they are mandated to provide prosecution of crimes against the Commonwealth in, in Massachusetts, for instance, and they're mandated to provide services to victims, mm -hmm. witnesses, and family members. And so there's, there's, there's not perhaps as, as much um, tooth to the bill as I, uh, you know, as many of us would like, but it's a really effective tool. It really does its job, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, the victim impact statement is, is probably such a significant part of that. That, that if, if victims and, and survivors are not um, part of, the, of um, the process in terms of testifying, they can have input. They can let the court know, they can let the defendant know what their feelings are. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they can have input into the sentencing process. And I, I, I think that there's nothing that's had a greater significance than that. You mentioned earlier in one of your comments that one of the challenges with victims' rights is, is the actual implementation. What have you found is um, effective in, uh, or what are the challenges in terms of, of implementing those rights and, and what strategies have been effective in, in making them a reality for crime victims? I think education um, and training that, um, that prosecutors, new prosecutors, certainly victim witness advocates, um, certainly advocates um, that are in community-based agencies, um, police, uh, hospitals, um, uh, the you know the community at large, that that they the awareness of those rights is very important to the provision of them. That that people um, need to know um, that that those rights are there. That they and we inform we're required by law to inform them of those rights and inform them of other services that they have the right to, um, and inform them about the process so that they're not just going in um, without any kind of preparation. Mm -hmm. So that that's part of what our Bill of Rights is in Massachusetts. And I, I mean, it's, it's pretty comprehensive, and it it's, um, includes the best practices that were um, you know, present in most district attorney's offices. That, that those were then incorporated into the bill. It's taken when I think of, of how many years, um, I believe um, District Attorney Kevin Burke and Karen McLaughlin were the most effective um, uh, people in passing it originally in 1983. Um, and it was revised again in 1995. And um, 
it's uh, you know it's it's really grown I think with the uh, the practice um, and I think that's a key the practice um, that victim um, services are a practice are a field um, and they are are part of the the prosecution team well we've talked about some of the successes of the field what in your mind are some of the failures or, or the challenges that remain out there for us I think judges need to um, be educated. Um, I think um, I think that, and I, and I don't mean, um, I think that most of them do a very good job and care very deeply. Um, and I, um, I think that um, the education needs to be ongoing. And, it, and just as it does for prosecutors, for victim advocates, uh, you know, uh, what is it that, that education is a lifelong process and you never stop learning. Um, and I think that learning opportunities have to be present all the time. And I think that sometimes um, in our state, for example, uh, judges aren't allowed to attend roundtables on domestic violence for fear of, of being seen as biased to one side or the other. And I understand that concept, but that and the requirement that that is. I mean, the, the, they do have to be impartial. But it also um, it keeps them from being oh, as much aware as they could be about other services in the community. So I think that sometimes um, that inhibits their, their knowledge. Um, I, think, um, I, I think we need to do a lot more um, prevention education. I think that is budgets um, are affected. The first thing to go is generally prevention programs um, and uh, you know that that we cannot continue to band-aid that there needs to be a really comprehensive program and prevention it is victim services uh, you know um, so I uh, the intervention has to be early um, and um, I, you know, I, I I think services have to be much more readily available than they are. There are huge waiting areas, or, or waiting um, lists rather, for um, services for children um, and for evaluations for children that are traumatized um, uh, by major catastrophes um, such as 9/11. There's there needs to be more in schools available for for kids, um, uh, teachers and and um, counselors and guidance counselors in our area are are seeing still some effects of 9/11, and and they don't have the resources to um, you know to provide the services and um, the the uh, on the cases that we're prosecuting, for example. In our county, um, there's just waiting lists for kids to get services. And what happens in that interim? Um, and services for parents. I think that um, parents of abused children, for example, often get left out of the loop, that there aren't as many services for them um, even as there are for children. So I, I think those have been some of the failures that, that um, most programs have had level funding for the last several years or more. And so there's no room for expansion. There's no room to meet growing needs. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we're in maintenance mode. Mm -hmm. And I, I, um, I think we need to be looking towards the future because we're losing ground. Mm -hmm. We've spent all these years, it's sort of one step forward and two back. Um, and I, I think budgeting is a huge problem across the board. I mean, it is with everyone. It isn't, um, but, but we're losing staff, therefore we're losing services. Um, and we're losing people because the field is a very poorly paid field. Um, and you cannot continue to attract people when they have to make a living, uh, you know. Um, so I think. Um, or, and retain people, I guess I'd say as well. Okay, thank you. Um, what would you say today is needed 
to continue the growth and professionalism of the field? What's still missing? Well, I think um, recognition that it's a profession. Um, and I think the, the move for certification, credentialing, is, um, is going to make a big difference in that area. I, I, um, I, you know, as a registered nurse and as an attorney, I'm expected to fulfill certain um, criteria. And I, I think that, that crisis counselors, I think that victim witness advocates and community-based advocates should also be required to meet certain qualifications and, and be tested. And I, but I also think that as a field in general, we have a responsibility, and, and I include um, the from the top people at state and local governments and prosecutors, that there needs to be a structure in place to provide supervision and support for doing this work, that, that this, is, this is heavy, um, work and that that people need to have a supervision structure in place um, and it, it needs to be supported it needs to be an okay thing um, uh, that that it's built into the program and I think those of us who've who've been in the field a while have a really strong responsibility to to really promote that and to do it ourselves wherever we can to affect um, that kind of change to make sure that there's some continuance um, that, that we keep that up, that we mentor, that we, um, that we supervise, that we put structures in place that create that possibility and that we do what we can to create a, a, um, a ladder for people. There are different, um, uh, there are there are supervision positions, there are training positions, there are um, administrative positions that experienced people should be able to achieve, um, to teach others, to, to help others to, to learn as well. Um, that, and I think all of that will create a stronger field and a stronger profession um, that we also need to integrate with all of those that we work with the whole, we need to be the major, a major piece in a multidisciplinary approach to um, crime victim services. Excuse me just a moment. Here we go. And whenever you're ready. Now let me ask you a follow-up question to that. You mentioned that support from the top was key in terms of um, assisting professionals in the field. Could you give some specific examples of what you have in mind? Well, I think if, if you have a, a program that, and I can speak primarily to one located within a prosecutor's office, um, that, that there's a structure, that there are supervisors, there isn't just me and the staff um, in, in, a, um, in a program structure that, um, that you have supervisors, senior supervisors, and you have a middle level that you're grooming for positions um, and that you can give more responsibility to, um, that, that there is time within everyone's um, work schedule for an hour to an hour and a half of supervision time worked out either once a week or every other week, particularly once a week when somebody is new. Um, that, uh, you know, for a certain amount of time. Our program is, for example, for three to six months, a brand new advocate works with um, one of the senior supervisors. And they, there's a one-on-one -on -one learning process going on. There's a review of cases. There's um, some play acting, um, role play, about um, how to handle somebody who's upset or angry or uh, somebody who seems to be not, um, not happy with the way a case is going. Are there other things that you could be providing for this person? Um, and, and also to, to look at doing that in a, a structure. So there's a, a peer supervision structure set up that, that there are frequent meetings for support, uh, that, um, that the supervisors themselves meet, um, that they are supervised by, for example, me, um, and that there's a peer supervision structure for them, that they have a say 
in, in how the, the program operates, that they have a say in um, how letters that are sent out to victims are worded, that, that they are able, those who are interested in training, they get an opportunity to train, to learn new skills, they get an opportunity to identify what their own training needs are. In our program, for example, we have a training committee and surveys are sent out to the staff about what they see as their present training needs, what they would like personally to, to explore. That gets discussed both with their, their individual supervisors, they have on-site supervisors as well, somebody who's available to them. Um, so, and those on-site supervisors are generally the people that we're grooming for more um, advanced positions. That, that there be that career ladder has to be developed. And that as people grow in expertise and they grow in, ex in, in practical experience, that they, um, they lend that to others. Uh, if we do a training, which we just did recently in our office on adult sexual assault cases, then we had a panel towards the end. We had um, a, a victim and a witness come in, certainly, which is a critical part to any training. Um, a victim survivor and um, and also important that a witness come in who who um, who also was a victim in this case mm -hmm. and um, that a panel of experienced advocates came in for the 14 advocates who were being trained um, this was a review for some who had been in the office for several years and it was a new training for some who hadn't yet had a sexual assault case mm -hmm. so um, it was tips and strategies and things that, that as experienced advocates, they, uh, they were able to share with the new people. So that's the process that, that um, I think is really important. It's an ongoing thing. It isn't just a two-week training when you come in, a 40-hour training when you come in. It's an ongoing process and has to be evaluated, has to be updated all the time. Uh, you mentioned mentoring and how important it is to sort of uh, educate the, the new up and coming. If, if a new advocate came into your office and plopped themselves down with brand new, what advice would you give them as a veteran advocate of this field? Well, um, I, I think I'd, uh, first even before she got there in, in the hiring process, and I think that's a piece too, um, I get to have a, a huge say in the hiring process. Um, as do other senior supervisors to make recommendations to the district attorney. And so the things that you're looking for are energy and passion because you can't do this work without some of that. Um, and uh, and the, the eagerness to learn as well as to work. Um, that, that the biggest things would be to never be afraid to ask questions. Um, to watch, to observe the more senior advocates, and uh, you know that that you're going to be placed with in your training um, schedule, and and really to listen. Um, and I often uh, use the phrase that that um, sometimes when I'm training that, or an orientation, that my husband used to use with our sons when they were younger. God gave you two ears and one month, one mouth. There's a reason for that, and and so that you just. Um, you look at that and, and, and really try to absorb. And um, I, I think to ask questions, to be, um, to also have somebody observe them um, when they're doing things and ask for feedback. And, um, and really to make, um, make use. A, a supervision is a two-way street. It is that the supervisee should come prepared for the session as well as the supervisor, that that's an opportunity to learn and to grow, both um, particularly, uh, you know, professionally. Um, so that they are, that they need to be part of the staff, and and um, so that that would be primarily my advice, and and that my door is open, that I would be available, and um, that they should never hesitate to call anyone, um, including myself. What would you say is your greatest fear for the victim's field? That, that we stay in this um, maintenance mode too long. Um, the complacency that people think that victim rights are okay, that they're, they're, um, and that we really don't have anywhere to go because we have 
lots of places to go. Um, and there are, um, uh, there are new fields that are opening up that we need to be prepared to deal with, particularly around you know, cyber stalking, any of the internet crimes, that those are just, I, I'm not sure we're keeping up with that at all. And, and uh, so it means that we, there's a huge learning curve here that we have to educate ourselves so that we can um, help in, in those areas. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm fearful of, of complacency and I'm fearful that, um, that we won't develop the field into that ladder of professionalism that I mentioned. Um, that what I see happening is a leveling off of salaries um, when budgets become um, a, a, um, a concern. And they are, and they're going to continue to be. Um, and that's a reality. Um, and I also, I, I think balancing that passion, I'm, I'm concerned that, that the passion be, um, be stirred up and that those younger people coming in have as much of it as, as we've had over the years. And I do think it's, it's, sometimes I look and say, how have we all sustained that level of passion for all of these years? And I think we've sustained it through NOVA certainly through connections with each other mm -hmm. because every time we come to a nova conference or or connect at something then it gets restored again every time we hear a victim survivor speak mm -hmm. and then you realize why you're in this field that you really do make a difference and that it counts and that you also as i've learned over the years as i'm sure many have um, you have to balance that passion with a sense of reality we can't do it all um, and uh, someone once said, you are, are you trying to save the world? And I said, no, just a little piece of it, a little piece at a time. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's what we all do. Um, so I think we have to, um, I'm not sure I see that level of passion in the newer staff. That I, I, see, um, I see sometimes that it's used as a stepping stone to another field. The, and, and there's a part of me that says that's okay. That I am, and I'm an attorney. I am a victim witness advocate who went on to law school. Mm -hmm. um, and while I've kept my feet in the field, um, I certainly think. Just like, okay. Oh, I certainly think that that background makes for a better attorney, mm -hmm. um, a better prosecutor, hopefully, um, even a better defense attorney. Um, and I, I, I mean. People have concerns throughout life, and so being sensitive to people's needs is part of this job, and, and anticipating them, um, as well as working with them to, to figure out ways of, um, of dealing with things. But I, I do see that, that we need to create that balance, um, and I think we need to do more. I think the credentialing, the certification process will help. But I, I think it, in our society, we value positions economically. And I don't think that, that if, if you look at what the pay scale is, and that doesn't mean that, that we have to be, uh, be paying exorbitant salaries at all. Because I think there are a lot of things that have to do with job satisfaction. Most people that are in this field aren't in it for the money but there's a lot of job satisfaction that they get. But I, I do think it needs to have some value on an economic level um, for all of us um, to be viewed as a, a viable and, and uh, an important profession with a future that will be sustained. Okay. Thank you. Well, and this may be the other half of the coin, but what do you see is your own vision of the field. Where, where do we want to go as a field in your mind? All of what I just said, yeah. um, certainly. Um, but, I, but I think that um, what I like is happening is that we are becoming institutionalized as a service, um, as victim services. I do think that piece is happening um, to some degree, to a, to a very large degree in many places. I think in my state it has. What I would like to see is 
that um, while the community-based programs have also grown tremendously and have become more, um, uh, I think, more organized, more, um, they have expanded more, I would like to see us working more together, that, um, that there's so much we can share with one another um, and so much more work to be done that, uh, that I, I think there's a danger um, of us being, you know, getting so caught up in turf issues that, that we lose sight of what we're really there for. And, and I think to some extent, funding really contributes to that, that it, we get put into competitive um, positions when um, those of us that are working in the field really don't want to be. And I, I think we need to work better at, at, um, at working better, I guess, is, is the way I might, I might put it. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to add for the of posterity, anything we haven't talked about, historical perspectives oh, that you think are important that haven't uh, been highlighted by my questions? I don't know. I guess I think I, I feel very lucky to have been part of this. And I, I think I feel um, in some instances that I was in the right place at the right time, and I'm so glad. Um, and I'm, I, I, I'm going to get emotional. I think that... Um, it has, it has made a difference, and I, I am so glad to be part of that. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's, that's what I'd like to say at the end. Thank you. I appreciate your thoughts. Thank you.